Hello everyone. Welcome to week two of the class. I hope you appreciated the, the reel cut together by Kate Novakova. She's done that the past two or three classes and uh, it was all her idea and I really appreciate her taking the time to gather everyone's homework, put them in a, a very convenient reel for all of us to enjoy at the beginning of each um, class or each stream once we have um, some homework to show. So thank you, Kate. I appreciate that. Um, I did not catch the name of the music track, but it's at the beginning. So at the very least, we'll be able to see that in the recording of the stream whenever I post that within the next 24 hours. So um, yeah, sorry. Sorry, I missed the song track. But yeah, welcome. This is week two. Um, week one was awesome. I was I was thoroughly impressed by the homework submissions as a whole. Very impressed by the level of activity in the homework threads. Um, peers helping each other, uh, advice being given, questions asked and answered. It was uh, it was one of the best weeks I've had in a class. So thank you for that. If you did not receive a grade yet from me, um, I'm just going to ignore you for the rest of the class. I hope that's okay with you. No, of course I'm not going to do that. I just there were too many to get through in a day. I literally graded nonstop. I mean, except for like a half hour lunch break. From, from like nine yesterday to 6 p.m. Um, so it was a solid eight hours of nonstop grading and I only did about, definitely more than half, but, but probably not quite 75%. So anyway, I'm gonna get to them, but uh, there's been a lot and I love that, I love the activity. But uh, typically people don't participate, the people who start don't participate through the whole month. So I expect participation to go down a little bit, but um, not that I want that, but I expect that to be the case. But um, anyway, I'm gonna get to your grades by the end of Wednesday is my goal. I'll have everyone's week one stuff graded and then be ready for week two. So uh, anyway, moving on, speaking of week one, I do like to start the stream um, by looking back and, and taking a look at some notable homework submissions. Um, but I, there might've been something first, I can't remember. Oh yeah, I did want to give a shout out to the VAs. Um, ben, you noticed I didn't have any glasses. Yeah, I, I, I'm wearing contacts. I used to wear contacts exclusively for, for like, man, 15 years, I think. And then for two years, I just kind of took a break and did the glasses thing. And uh, I, I went back to, I'm kind of in the middle testing out contacts again. So that's why no glasses today. But um, I want to thank you to the VAs. VA is, stands for Volunteer Assistance. I had four people this time email me and ask to, to be an, a VA this month. And Aaron Rutterham, uh, the Cabbage Detective is the username. You'll want to remember these usernames because they're people to reach out to for help, uh, ask questions um, if, if I'm for some reason not around. Or they're just, they're my equals in, in those terms. And um, Spiky XXX, Silent Heart Double Zero, and Dragon Claw is how I pronounce that. But um, thank you for reaching out and volunteering your time to be helpful to everyone. I've seen you in the threads often quicker than I get in the threads, answering questions. Um, but you've been a, a tremendous help to me and I know to, to your fellow peers. So thank you for that. Now, I, some honorary uh, VAs, Zolt, who makes and maintains the the uh, report card spreadsheet. He's way better at all that than me. And he's got these crazy formulas gathering data across all classes. So I appreciate that, Zolt, and uh, uh, thank you for doing that. Um, Kate, of course, she's the one that's making the reels. So, um, I mean, she's an honorary VA for sure. So thank you to all the VAs, and you will definitely get um, some extra points at the end because I know that's really why you and anyone else is here is for the XP. So I will, I will give you some XP. Um, let me make sure that I'm not missing any questions. Um, oh, I did also want to say, uh, I had a couple questions about people who haven't who missed week one and could they participate in, uh, in from week two and three? And yes, I, I will say you can definitely do that. Um, someone already answered the fact that uh, if you just uh, post week one and two together in your week two submission, that's probably going to be the best way. And I will just grade both of those at the same time. Um, um, Yes, I think that's all I wanted to say. So yeah, you're welcome to participate starting at week two and going through to week three. Um, excellent. All right, so thank you, VAs. Now, I wanted to move on to some notable homework submissions. I, I used to call it my favorites, but but uh, I'll, I'll try and clarify this. Someone called me out for uh, for this approach and they said they didn't they didn't think this was the best way to approach it by, by uh, 
commending or, or shining a spotlight on on my my favorite submissions and therefore by implication favorite artists. That is not my intention at all with this. Rather, to highlight notable homework submissions, my goal is for them to be teaching moments. Um, not even to really uh, highlight the artists themselves, but to um, highlight the choices that they're making, how they are distinguishing themselves from everyone else, or, or how they're at least, this is me too, this is just relative to me, what sticks out in my head when I was looking through all of them. And, and even with that, you know, I didn't get to all the homework submissions. I watched the reel, of course, but um, um, it, this is an in, incomplete picture of like notable, you know, there's people who, who, would, who would make this list, but I didn't want the list to take forever. So uh, these are just people that I wanted to, this is art that I wanted to um, go over and, and try to explain why they stand out. And hopefully all of us can learn from that because I think being notable is something we all should strive for. Uh, whether you want to it land a job in the industry, you want to stand out from the other people competing for that job, whether you want to win a CG contest online, um, you'll want to stand out there, obviously. Uh, or even if you want to just, if you think to yourself, I don't want to stand out, I don't want to be notable, I just want to do my thing on my own. If you want to just recreate reality one-to-one, -one, you would think that's not standing out. But if you achieve that, not many people achieve that perfectly. So you will stand out. Like that is developing noteworthy skills. So that's why I want to just showcase some some that I think are notable and hopefully you can learn um, how how to get there. You know, like take take notes from those things, tips and tricks. So the first one is from Kaj. Um, I don't think it's your first time in the in the favorites slash notable uh, um, selection. Kaj is a great artist. He's done multiple classes and this is an example of being able to follow and learn from the the treasure chest project, but not stopping there. He went further and especially the level of detail. Now it is his own design and there's a design sense to it that he is pushing himself in, but the detail especially is, is further than what, what I established in the, in the treasure chest project. So I like that he is learning from it, but applying it and taking it further. That as a, as a teacher, I really want to see that in my in my students. I want to see people who learn from the videos to to make it their own, to um, exert themselves further and uh, and keep pushing themselves. So, I mean, as far as details, I think I focus more on the back hinges than any other part. I just love how intricate they are and and how they make mechanical sense. As a modeler, that really you know gets me excited and 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 makes me admire it. But the level of detail over the entire thing is consistent. It's, it is, again, it's more detailed than mine. So hats off to Kaj. I love the, the pieces on the front too, mul like multiple layers, um, interacting with each other, make, again, making mechanical sense, which I think is, is really uh, something to strive for as a modeler and something to be aware of. So excellent work, Kaj. And next, uh, work from Tijin. This was, um, I tweeted about this because I thought this was super cool. Uh, one of the more unique interpretations of the treasure chest project by um, making it a booby tracked kind of like security measure and you know a cannon pops out instead of um, the, you just open it up and get treasure so I thought that was super clever and then when you open it up the little mechanism um, to, to show like this this little uh, contraption helps open the trap door to reveal the cannon um, that is just thinking like a modeler which Again, if you are going to be a successful modeler, you're going to have to think how things function in reality, both both how form how to shape forms or form shapes, however you want to say it, but also like how shapes make sense. When you, if you build a car, you're going to need to understand how cars function a little a little bit better in order for the model to make sense. Um, and so you can see that from from Tijin um, being exemplified here. Um, also the fact that it's a unique design, he, he's getting into a creative space and doing something I've, I can't say I've seen before. Um, so whether he's inspired by a, something else that, you know, use this idea, but, um, this was, I thought a very well executed, um, technically executed model because the, the style's really good edges and forms are, are excellent. But then that extra element of creativity, I, I think is very noteworthy and, and, um, and I'm still working on that myself. I think if I lack anything, especially, um, I lack a lot. But if what I know that I lack a lot is creativity. Um, I'm I typically just recreate what I see, but but to in, inject truth, truly something unique um, to to a model 
um, is something that I'm still working on. So I, I admire this. I think we all should strive to be creative whenever we're modeling. So excellent work, Tijin. And uh, so a couple signs that I really liked from Dieter, I believe I'm, I'm pronouncing that, at least that's what Google Translate told me, Dieter and Clint. Um, on the left, we've got a combination of, of being a sign, but also incorporating the barrel element. I really like that. That to me is an example of, of um, taking the, the, the road less traveled, I guess, or, or a, a more difficult road for the sake of learning. Um, not, um, I, I respect that. And, um, and it's working great here. Both of these are working together in this kind of alehouse sign situation. It, it looks great. Uh, wonderful technical execution. I like the combination a lot. And then uh, on the right, we've got one of the more unique signs, which, which instead of using a wooden post, it's using like a little tree. Um, that is holding the sign board. I think that's really cool. I've not seen anything quite like that. Um, again, standing out, thinking outside the box. Whenever you're presented the box, you stick sort of within it, but like expand it too. I think that's a, a, a wonderful exercise in creativity. Um, a question from Quite Nameless. How do you research for modeling? Um, that would have been a great question for last week, especially, but for researching for modeling, I immerse myself in reference. Like I, I'm a, I'm a broken record on that point. I, I really value reference. Creating things from my own head has always been difficult. It, it especially takes longer. But if I, I grab 20 to 30 reference images, it's going to be a much more enjoyable and, and fruitful uh, modeling process. So, so when I think of a model I want to build, if it's a character, for example, I will scour examples from ArtStation um, and and usually compile them in a collection on Pinterest and and I will reference. I mean, some of my collections have you know hundreds of of, of examples, um, but yeah, I immerse myself in reference and then sometimes I will I will do a sketch. You know, I I, I used to be a good illustrator, but not I don't think so much anymore. Um, but I will sometimes do a sketch. Or just dive in and and let the reference be my guide. That's kind of how I research models. Did you also Google Translate my last name? Oh no, is it not? I've always called you Dominic, but I think you're suggesting that I, I'm, I've never pronounced it right. But no, I'll plug that in. Um, oh, correctly right away. Oh no, I didn't. I didn't. I guess I guessed correctly on that one. Um, so uh, back to some notable homework submissions. And also, if I miss a question, we've got a pretty active chat. So if if it goes by too quickly and I don't notice, if the VAs or if anyone, but uh, especially if the VAs would, would would note that and like remind me to answer the question, that would be great. Um, but I think I just have one more notable homework uh, submissions um, from Jack on the left and Spikey. Um, modeling, in this case, I think all, except for the sign, like, like modeling multiple things and then building it out into a complete scene. Um, what I think is cool about this is number one, it's, it's harder work. You're, you're taking more on, you're challenging yourself. Um, and, and, um, no, oh, I just lost my train of thought. Oh, but you're also, whenever you create a full scene, you're starting to dip your toe into storytelling because you have to imagine like, where would this make sense? It, the, and on the left, you know, it's like this kind of tavern, something underground stone wall sort of feeling to it. And you start to think elements like in order to fill that out, correctly or in a way that makes sense, you've got to start thinking of, of storytelling elements. On the right from Spikey, you know, it looks like the galley of a, or the belly of like a ship. And um, you've got uh, the barrel and then you've taken what you've learned from the barrel and I assume the treasure chest with the wooden planks. You've made crates from it. You've made a wooden floor. You've made this post in the middle to hold up, I guess, support the ship, stairs. So that is um, examples to me of taking what you've learned and applying it in a different way um, and that is, again, a huge reward for me as a teacher. And I think it's it's applying what you have learned. Um, it's, it's a true application of what you've learned. And in saying this, I don't mean to knock the people who who try, who follow the treasure chest or, or any tutorial very specifically. I think that to do that as a beginner is especially important. Or if you've not done computer graphics for a while, if you're if you're brushing back up on your skills, I think the early stages of learning, very important to follow um, exactly. But... But the next step is to apply it in a unique way. And that is proof that you have truly learned something, not just how to mimic, but you've learned how the technique um, can be used to, to create something um, uh, different and specific to yourself. So uh, that's what I, I like to affirm and push you guys towards uh, being able to apply um, in a different way than the tutorial. So 
that's hopefully you've taken some things from there. How to, how what makes a notable homework as, uh, assignment? But um, again, it's supposed to be a, a learning point for all of us to. What can I do to improve my work? You know, I've been learning things from people here too. Um, so that's the goal. All right, on now to one thing that came up especially is this this uh, low poly um, question, does my model count as low poly? I saw it several times because I said we're keeping the project theme low poly. And I wanted to explain that a bit more. I think it's, it's, con it's confusing. Um, and then it con I confirmed that by asking uh, CG Cookie crew members what they thought of, of the word low poly. And we all had different kind of uses for it. So um, low poly to me, I, I, I covered this a little bit last week, but, but to hammer at home, low poly is less about a number of polygons and more about the approach to modeling. So both of these are, I think, I would consider them low poly. They're both game models on the left, uh, uh, Link from Breath of the Wild, only 12,500 polygons. It's a modern game, though it did come out in 2017, which is uh, longer than I remember it coming out. But um, uh, then on the right, it's from the Last of Us game. And clearly the polygon counts, though I don't have the exact number on the right, the polygon counts are vastly different, but they're both games. They're both, I would consider them low poly. Now, um, Jonathan Williamson would call it real time, which I, I understand that term too, and kind of use them interchangeably. But um, the big difference is that they're not being modeled for smooth. They have to perform in a real time environment, in a game environment, for example. Um, uh, Omar, are those the real models are really using the game. Yes, I was trying to find that because you know you have fan art all over the place, but but on the left, this is from a YouTube channel. Um, oh, I can't remember the name of the YouTube channel, but the series is called Low Poly, and he rips game models from games and shows like the evolution of Link from from like uh, Ocarina of Time to Majora's Mask to Skyward Sword all the way through to see how game models develop. That's super interesting, and I highly recommend it. Um, it's, I'm subscribed to it. I love seeing that series. Um, so you can see how technology has advanced. And um, on the left, this is, as far as I could tell, definitely from, from the game, uh, Last of Us. But it is kind of hard to find legit from game wireframes. Like I, I tried to look for God of War and couldn't find a single one. Anyway, I consider both of these low poly because they have to perform in a real-time environment. They have to be efficient. Same with this. You've got um, low poly guns, really low poly weapons on the left. You know, the shotgun, for example, is only 342 triangles. On the right, we're looking at another weapon, but 8,221 triangles. But they're both low poly because they have to perform in a real-time environment. And that's why it's less about the number of polygons, but more about the situation and how to be most efficient for the situation. The opposite end of the spectrum is, is uh, I guess there's not like a non-real-time isn't really a term, but um, offline rendering is the, is the most official term I've heard. Uh, re render engines like, like Cycles or V-Ray or Octane Render, like these engines that are, are primarily where efficiency is not, is not what people input into those render engines. The, the visual um, fidelity and render quality is what they're after. So the way I describe it is like low poly and real time is where efficiency is king. All right. And then you've got visual quality, which is second priority. Now you always want that to be high quality, but never eclipsing efficiency, right? Because you always have to run real time. You cannot sacrifice, you cannot sacrifice real time capability for visuals. The opposite, render engine cycles, uh, V-Ray, offline rendering, as it's, it's typically referred to, is the opposite. Like, it's all about the final visual quality. I don't even really care about the efficiency. The only time I care about efficiency is if my render literally can't happen because I don't have enough RAM, my computer's not powerful enough. That's when efficiency comes into play and, oh, I need to maybe uh, optimize some of these models a little bit. Um, so that's kind of the difference. Now, as technology evolves, the, the gap between them is growing steadily less apparent. And I think they're going to even out to where technology is going to be so fast that, that you get truly high resolution, completely detailed models in real time. Um, so that the, the terms are kind of evening out a little bit. Um, but for this project and how it, how it um, relates to our class is 
is the idea of modeling for smooth. Whenever you, whenever you don't really care about efficiency, you just want high quality render result. You don't want to see, you don't want to risk any polygons being visible. You go for rendering uh, for smooth. But um, I had a couple terms here. So to try and put it in, in sentences, low poly or real time is a measure of efficiency. Best I can, the, the best my knowledge can, can, can say succinctly. Um, and therefore, if you're, if you're not modeling for smooth to be rendered with cycles or, or where it might take an hour to render, 10 minutes to render a single frame, then you're modeling low poly or real time or for efficiency. Now, the, to talk about smooth, this GIF is an example. So it starts low resolution, right? And then actually this is not the beginning of the GIF. Let me wait a minute. And this is the beginning. It's a low poly mesh, but it's not intended to be low poly. This is where it's smooth. It's intended to be perfectly smooth around the edges. This is the low poly mesh. And then this is the high poly mesh. So that's where I come from. I, I always have modeled things for smooth to be, to use a subsurf modifier to where all of the, these silhouettes are perfectly smooth. You never see faceting. And so I don't care about render time really. It's like, if it takes 10 minutes, it takes 10 minutes. That's what high quality visuals require. Um, so we are not doing that for this class. Rather, we're doing the other because I think I think modeling for smooth is just another level of complexity that's not needed, especially for beginners. And if you are are experienced, um, then it's a good exercise to do the low poly and and um, enter that world because again, they're kind of they used to be really far separate. Like think of Nintendo sixty four, PlayStation days, really really far apart. Like like movie graphics was so far apart from games, but like they keep getting closer and closer. All right, that was a lot, but that was probably what I had to prepare for most to try and explain that term, especially when, when low poly real time are kind of, they used to be very definitive, but they're losing the, the meaning a little bit over time. So anyway, does anyone have any questions? Did I miss any questions? Is low poly a typo or is that how it's written? Um, I mean, that's a, that's a good question too. I've seen both L-O-W poly, but also L-O poly. So I don't, I didn't, it, that's what I meant, L-O poly, but I don't know if if that's technically wrong. Um, I don't think I hit any, missed any other questions. So if you had any question about if your model was low poly, as long as you were not using a subsurf, then yeah, it's low poly in my book. And oh, one more note about that is it doesn't mean that you cannot, you, like to be low poly, you have to avoid subsurf entirely. I, it's not uncommon for me to model low poly, but I will use a subdivision surface modifier to increase the topology to be at a level I need to to work with. For example, this is someone in the class who is modeling an axe and the low poly version, the blade was too jagged and, and they didn't like that. They wanted to smooth it out. One option could be to bevel those specific edges, but also I, was, I, I made the suggestion, you could add a subsurf modifier at a level of one and just apply it. That's automatically automatically going to smooth this geometry. You'll have more geometry to add any details that you might want to add, but it's not so high poly that the, a, a real-time engine couldn't handle it or, or Eevee couldn't handle it in real time. It's still pretty low. I think only maybe 100, 200 poly, something like that. Um, so anyway, like it was just something I wanted to share um, with everybody. So. Now I can stop talking about that and move on to, yeah, we'll finish the stream, um, or we'll finish the presentation, sorry, with uh, this week two agenda. We're done modeling, and now we're moving into texturing, all right? So that means uh, besides the stream, if you want recorded education uh, to watch and to reference, chapter two of the Treasure Chest course is exactly what we're going over, um, I think, yeah, it's exactly what we're going over this week. So we're just texture painting, laying out UVs, and the homework is therefore to use the model that you modeled in week one to lay out the UVs, paint and color, uh, paint a color texture specifically. And you'll see what I mean um, by the end of the stream. Question, how do you slide a vertex along an edge? Um, okay, yeah, sure, I can show you that real quick. <laughs> um, all right, so yeah, we can jump into Blender. Thankfully, a shorter stream, a shorter presentation today. But um, yeah, so we're gonna start with the sword model that I, I, I worked on last week, pick it up with the texture painting process. Um, I typically make the room warm when I stream, so I'm gonna turn on my fan real quick. Oh, 
hopefully that shouldn't cause too much noise, but um, I always cut that out of the recording anyway. All right, so yeah, someone asked about edge sliding. So when we tab into edit mode, you can, that's what you asked about. How do you slide a vertex along an edge? Just select any vertex and then hitting G twice will slide in a direction that your mouse is pointing. All right, so if you move the mouse left, it'll slide to the left most uh, edge, up, right, and so on. Um, so very simple, just G twice. I should, that reminds me to enable screencast keys. I swear this thing always ends up in a random position. All right, there we go. Um, question, where do you find the recording from last week? I watched part of it, but I'd like to finish. Yeah, sure, I'll show you that. Let's see here. So all live streams end up in the community events. If you go to past events, all right, any, any archived recording is, is available here. Um, and then also there's another place if you go to 3D Blender or any specific you know, subject, there's a live streams um, category. And there you can also find, let's see, creating, where is it? Uh, so the problem with this currently is that it's, it's organized by when the stream was created and published, not when it was broadcast. So I'm, I put in a ticket to our developer to, to change that, but but I created the class long before I created some of these other streams that happened before the actual class. But you should be able to find, now this is BC1, 1908. So where is 1908 week one? Right here. All right, so this is week one. That's a less intuitive place to find it. The best place is in events and past events. All right, back to Blender. All right, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we are talking about texture painting. Let me ask a question. Press one in the chat if you have never laid out UVs or texture painted in 3D before. Curious, because I remember thinking when I first discovered UV layout that it, was, it seemed like a very unnecessary, kind of frustrating task just to get to what I really wanted to do, which was painting. All right, so several ones. Um, okay, so texture painting, I think in general, especially the UV part is kind of weird at the beginning, but it makes sense the more you do it. And, and that's what we're gonna have to start with because you can't really paint a texture until you lay out the UVs. Um, so if, you, if it's difficult for you getting started, I understand that, I was there too. And it doesn't help that I think Blender's texture painting specifically is less intuitive than other applications. And, and we'll get to that. But for now, we're going to be UV editing. And I'm gonna jump over to the UV edit workspace, which I also learned recently that the screencast keys does not translate over to, to other workspaces. Um, where is, where is it? There it is. So that's a bummer. In my in my treasure chest course, if I switch workspaces, the screencast keys disappear. So I do apologize for that. Had to had to learn that the hard way. Um, so yeah, we are in. We switched over to the UV editing workspace. This is this is arguably the 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 most intuitive place to start for this. Um, and we the process of laying out UVs. If you haven't watched a treasure chest, it's a there's a pretty good explanation I think about UVs and, and the fact that it's kind of like a reverse origami. If you imagine this this model or any model you built as being starting as flat pieces of paper and then being cut and formed into a 3D model, that reverse process unfolding the model and laying it flat as if it was a piece of paper is the UV process. And so it involves taking the 3D model, cutting what are, what are, what's referred to as seams, and letting the computer unfold the model flat. And then therefore we, we literally are creating a canvas, a 2D canvas for us to paint an image. Um, so uh, to start, I, I need to focus on edges, right? To, to cut these seams. And from the modeling portion, we have the blue edges highlighted, which represent uh, sharp edges. And that's just gonna be distracting. So I'm gonna turn that off in the overlays right here. I can turn off sharp edges visualization. They're still sharp, but it's just not visualized that way. And seams will be visualized as red edges. So I'm gonna start with the handle 
and we're going to unwrap this. Now, the handle is a cylinder, and you can think of how the, to best unwrap it, or at least a, a very crucial cut that you'll have to make is if you take a flat piece of paper and you roll it up into like a cylinder, um, it's, the, it's the exact same thing in reverse. Um, so you need to cut a seam all the way down, and that will represent the two borders of the paper that have been rolled and then connect at the ends. So holding Alt and clicking on any vertical edge that, that spans the entire length of the cylinder shape, you can click any of them. Now, in this case, there's not really one that's gonna be better than the other. Uh, it's, it's all gonna be a consequential seam no matter which one you cut. So I'll just cut on the side, Control E, um, to bring up mark the mark seam option. You can also find it in edge, I think, edge mark seam. Whoops, I accidentally un, un, deselected, edge mark seam. All right, so when this ha when you mark a seam, nothing actually happens. You have to unwrap that object. So if I now select the object or select the mesh component, control L, that uh, selects the entire island. And in the UV menu, you can choose unwrap. And you can see that it, it, it did exactly that. It's a very apt name for the tool. It separated the mesh elements along this red line and just laid them flat the best it could. This takes us into the idea of stretching because unless, you know, there, it is possible to achieve a perfect unwrap, but this object has a taper to it, right? Like the cylinder is a little wider up top and it thins as it gets to the bottom and then it does, this, you know, it kind of gets bigger again and then smaller again. So this makes it an imperfect unwrap. And so you get... Uh, you know, you get a little bit of warping. Now, we need to be able to measure that warping and decide if it's a problem or if it's okay. Um, additionally, I guess before I actually talk about the stretching, in the unwrap operator, you do have two methods that I encourage you to be aware of and then uh, try one or the other. Um, you've got angle-based and you've got conformal. Now, for this particular example, conformal works better. I, I admit that I'm not entirely knowledge, knowledgeable about the math that's going into these methods. Since it's only two methods, I just pick which one looks better. Um, so conformal looks better in this situation because it's, it's more symmetrical. So it seems to obey the symmetry that's present in the model. A question from Concrescence. How do you disconnect discrete parts of the object, i.e. the handle from the blade? So when I built the model, I, how do I do that? It's a good question. I think I knew when I built the model that, you know, putting a cylinder into a square shape, you know, cylinder into a round pole or, a, you know, what is it? A circle into a, a what is it? How was this phrase? A round peg into a square hole, you know, that kind of saying. I knew that this, this wasn't going to connect very well, but I could easily make them separate objects and just, you know, butt them up to each other, make them slightly intersect. Um, while you could connect this, it's just gonna be a little more work that's unnecessary for this particular example. So when I looked at the sword, I kind of thought what shapes are similar and would make sense to be islands of their own. And it was the handle, the crossbar, and then the cross guard maybe, forget what this is called, and then the blade. Um, but that, that is something to develop. You, I, I kind of think learning from experience is the best teacher there because I, you know, I learned after a while that, hey, I just don't need to take the time to connect this specifically, so I don't need to. You know, you kind of identify parts of the model. Yeah, it's definitely part of the of the skill of modeling. Um, you will definitely develop that over time. Um, unless you were asking specifically, maybe that wasn't answering your question at all. How do you disconnect discrete parts of the object? Yeah, the Y key. Sorry, if you were just asking for the hot key, sorry for the long explanation. Um, all right, so going back to the cylinder and unwrapping this. So I like the conformal method better. It just it gives me a more symmetrical unwrap. But to, to visualize the stretching, we need to go to the end panel inside the UV editor. I'm going to hit the end panel and then choose the view in hotkey and then choose the view tab. And then sort of tucked away pretty discreetly is the overlays option. If we, if we roll that out, you see the stretching option. So let's turn that on. And you'll start to see color on your UV islands. And the color spectrum, blue represents perfectly unwrapped UVs. And red represents um, very stretched UVs. And then the, the rainbow spectrum in between, you know, 
teal to blue, or, I'm sorry, teal to green to yellow means the stretching is getting more apparent. And then to orange to red, it means the stretching is getting worse and worse. So you want to land on blue. Um, and right, so there's also two different types of stretching to visualize. The default is angle. And personally, I, I, I rarely use angle, if ever, because it almost always looks perfect. You could see this and think, oh, my, the, the unwrap is perfect. I can just stop. But really, if the more useful visualization is area stretching. If we click on that, we, we see a, the wide spectrum, including orange being the most part. This is a little misleading initially because it also, the stretching depends on scale of the UV islands. So if I, um, I'm going to invert my selection and then just for demonstration's sake, I'm gonna to go to UV, smart UV project. Okay, this is going to lay out auto UVs, which are rarely ideal, um, but it's going to give me the UVs in our UV editor and then when I select everything, now we see the handle and I need to, I need to uh, average the island scale. So with everything selected, UV average island scale. All right, so now we, we, the scale values between the islands are, are proper, they're, they're, they correlate to each other. And we can see that this layout is not ideal because we're in the, the blue to greenish teal range for the majority of the handle. And then we even get into the red range towards the bottom of the pommel. Um, so this tells me that especially down here, there's, there's stretching that needs to be relieved in the UV layout. Um, you know, I think I, what this makes me think of is like my wife will uh, ask me to crack her back sometimes. And so I either, you know, like, like hold her and kind of shake her or she lays down and I like put pressure on her back. But like when it cracks, it's immediate relief. <laughs> That's just what I kind of think of with this thing. Um, so, I, it tells me that I need to cut another UV seam towards the bottom. And this makes sense as you get to know UVs a little bit better because this, this situation is, you'll know that it's gonna cause UV stretching. It's just not gonna be ideal. So I can go to edge mode and note that like, if you don't have anything selected in the mesh, um, in mesh edit mode, then you won't see anything in the UV editor unless you enable this button right here, which is UV sync selection. Um, it will always show your UVs, but it will, whatever you select in the edit mode, you also are selecting in the UV mode. Looks like I'm uh, a couple questions I need to, uh, to answer from Omar. There's an, a great add on for UV unwrapping cylinders called quad unwrap. It lays them flat. Very useful. I have not used it, but, um, I've not used it. Uh, I need to, I should, I definitely need to. I've learned as a, a teacher to kind of avoid add ons because if my workflow gets dependent on add-ons, it makes it hard to teach everyone from like the default. So I typically avoid add-ons, but I've heard good things about quad unwrap and uh, therefore it's definitely worth a try, I'd say. From Tobles, I've read that seams add the vertices a second time to the ver vertex count. Is this true? Can that interfere with low poly? I've read that seams add vertices a second time. Uh, I've never heard that before. I know that like in theory, I guess, so for example, I'm clicking one edge, one seam, and visually it looks like four verts are selected in the UV editor, but I do not think that it actually increases the vert count of the mesh. So therefore has no effect on, I don't know why that would have an effect on like the efficiency of the model, but that's the first time I've ever heard that before. But I, I mean, what I think of is the fact that this is the same edge, but it's been separated. So it has to visualize it as two. Uh, man, several questions. Seeing as we're working on low poly models, is there going to be a suggested limit to the size of the textures, 512, for example? I'm probably going to paint mine at like 2048 because, you know, we're doing low poly, but I, I, we're not doing a specific game model. Could it work in a game? Yes. Um, certainly better than if we were going the, the, the modeling for subsurf smoothing. Um, but I was trying to be specific that this is, I'm not making a game model because to really do a game model, you need to know the expectations of the game engine or your game project, right? Um, so I, we're, I'm not going into that stuff, but I'm gonna do 2048 because I can always scale down the texture um, and I like to paint higher than than maybe I think I need. Um, but like a 1024 would probably be, be, be easy uh, for this. 512 is getting a little bit small in my opinion. 
I should also say, I'm not a game artist by trade. You kind of learn these things, you know, in, in when I've been involved around game projects or, or tried on my own, but like, I've never worked professionally on, on a game project. Um, so it's not really my background. Um, so I don't try to act like I am that. Um, let's see, from Blanche, does having a mirror modifier help on symmetry items during the UV process? I guess it has its uses and sometimes doesn't depend if you want to repeat textures. Right, so it depends for me. Now in this example, I want to add some, uh, you know, I prefer asymmetry. Now, if this was a if this was a game situation and the, the sword is never going to be that close to screen, it's it's used by the enemies way off in the distance or something, um, then yeah, maybe I would go ahead and and who cares about asymmetry? Let it be symmetrical, use the mirror modifier. For this example, and for like for quote hero assets, you know, like like uh, the main character's weapon or the main character himself, I, I strongly recommend asymmetry for for uh, so that so that symmetry is not noticeable. That will ruin the illusion of, of computer graphics a lot of times. So for this, I applied the mirror modifier I, uh, and and I'm going to, uh, well, also for the modeling, I added asymmetrical details. Um, so like I kind of committed to asymmetry, but yeah, the, the mirror modifier is great for just getting that texture information and UV information to, on the other side for free, certainly. Okay. Um, all right, so back to the, the UV, cutting some seams to relieve this stretching. Uh, at the bottom, I know that I can cut an edge right here. I'm gonna alt click on this edge and control E, mark seam. While I'm doing this, should I do that? Yeah, I think I will. While I'm doing this, let's go ahead and turn on live unwrap because I'm, I'm doing a lot of, for demonstration, I'm gonna be making a lot of cuts, doing an unwrap, making a lot of cuts, unwrap. Um, so to make this a little more visual, visually intuitive, we can turn on what's called live unwrapping. So in the UV menu, it's kind of silly. I have to do this both in the 2D editor and in the 3D view. So UV, uh, where is it? Live unwrap, which, which won't do anything until I change it over here as well. I feel like you can have one setting for both, but um, oh well. Live unwrap, all right? So now I've cut this edge and control, well, let me undo, now control E, mark seam, and you'll see that that the uh, everything unwrapped automatically. And right away we're getting, why is it green? In when I was rehearsing this, it was blue pretty much right away. Maybe I'll just cut off, let, let me cut off the pommel entirely. All right, let's try this again. Trial and error, you know. Um, it's, it's funny how much the rehearsal does not translate 100% to when you're actually doing it live. Control E, mark seam. All right, this is this is definitely better. I don't know why this is green. It's kind of bothering me. That should be blue. This is a very even unwrap. Uh, interesting. Um, hope it doesn't ruin the demonstration. But uh, so I've cut off the pommel from up here. I'm also going to cut an edge around the bottom cap. All right, so if control E, mark seam there, that's going to relieve the, the stretching around here pretty good. And because when it's when it's connected, you can see how concentrated it has to be around the, the cap. So if we redo that, um, it's really bothering me that this is green. All right, let me do an experiment. I'm going to separate the handle from the rest of the model. So select it, P, separate by selection, you let me you unwrap strange that's weird that's, it, i promise you that i use conformal in the rehearsal and it looked better than this it was less stretching but when i use angle based this is very blue it, it's just a better unwrap in general Anyway, so that's kind of how I work. If it, if I just, I pick whichever method you, it works best. It, it works out for me. So we've unwrapped this now. Um, I will go ahead and connect it to the rest of the model and and lay out the seams for everything else. Um, although maybe for demonstration purposes, it makes sense to separate. Yeah, I'll just do that. I'm treating it as three separate pieces. You don't have to do this with your model. You can cut all the seams at once if you want. Select all the UV islands and average island scale. Um, 
So I think that when you unwrap, it should do that automatically. Let me try UV average island scale. Apparently not. Whoops. You unwrap. Let me go back to conformal. You un uh, average island scale. Yeah, for some reason, the conformal is just not, it's stretching too much. I don't know why. Anyway, for the sake of demonstration, I think I will do these individually. So let's move on to the crossbar. All right, this is essentially a box shape. If you really think about it, it's primarily a box that's that's just shaped slightly differently. And boxes are quite easy to unwrap. Um, so if you imagine having a cardboard box that you get from Amazon or, or, or some shipment or something, you can, if you want to lay that flat to fit in the trash can and take up less space, you can take a razor blade and cut along the edges and then it will lay flat. Or if you, you can also keep it together as one piece, um, you don't have to cut all the edges, but only certain edges so that it, it all lays flat, but it's all still connected. Um, uh, from Greg, if you if the area you are modeling is really small and the viewer won't notice any small details, is it worth trying to get the stretching optimized? Great point, Greg. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, no, you can definitely prioritize what what the important areas of the model are. So if we go back to the handle, you know the this this pommel, for example, is not is not like a focal point of the sword. So the fact that there's a little bit of green and teal is okay, right? Like I'm fine with it stretching a little bit because it's not gonna matter, it's on a small part of, of the model. Um, so in that way, you can prioritize where your seams are most important, where to focus more of your time in the layout. Um, and so for this cross guard, for example, this will bring up an opportunity to talk about whether or not you should prioritize seams here. But um, um, let me uh, ask, answer this question from Matthew. Do you recommend not having any modifiers on the model before UV unwrapping? I think my split edge modifier is creating extra or duplicate island faces. Yeah, I do find that whenever you're using modifiers, going into the, the UV uh, portion of, of your workflow can get more com can just become more complex by having those extra modifiers. Uh, it's not that you can't do it, but I think you need to be very familiar with how Blender works and how modifiers work. So for beginners, I definitely do not recommend. Oh, Matthew, I know you're not a beginner, but but if you're gonna use modifiers, you just gotta be aware that, that things can happen exactly how you describe. Like something things seems to be going on, it must be because of my modifiers. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think I'm, now that I'm thinking back to my workflow, the, the, accept, uh, the rule is definitely that I, I collapse the modifiers for the most part. Um, there's a couple exceptions, but um, like, like uh, multi-res modifier, for example, sometimes I'll leave that on a high-res model. But typically I try to collapse the model down and apply the modifiers. Um, only in rare occasions do I, I leave modifiers active. Um, and all right, so yeah, we moved on to the crossbar. Remember, it's basically a square or a box that's been elongated and, and one side has been slightly shaped. So this is gonna be an easy thing to unwrap. I, I think I told you about the box and how to lay it flat by, you know, if you've got an Amazon package, you razor edge, razor the edge. So we're gonna do that exact same concept here. And we can be very efficient. In fact, I'm going to cut three of the four edges on the end cap. All right, that's gonna be this right here. All right, so that's three of the four square edges. All right, that if you can imagine that this is a razor blade that cut those edges, that flap will now fold out, okay? Uh, for you, maybe it looks, I'm trying to see in the camera, if it's like flat like this, it's going to fold out like that. Um, so then if that happens, we're left with essentially a cylinder in a, in a box shape, meaning we only need to cut an edge down the length. Uh, did I do that correctly? Yeah, so this will unfold flat. Now I only cut, or I only selected edges on one half because we have a tool. If I hit spacebar, which I use spacebar for tool search, it, the default is function F3. 
I believe, which still works for me. So you can, yeah, you can look up the word mirror and, and choose select mirror. Now that's going to, by default, just flip the selection around if the model is, symmet is symmetrical. And uh, it is because it came from a mirror modifier, but I can choose the extend option down here and it will remember what was selected initially. Control E, mark seam. And there we have a really good layout. It's blue with just slight touches of teal. Now, this is a bigger part of the model compared to the pommel. So we have an option here where we can, if we don't like the stretching, we can actually get a perfect layout if I just cut edges right here. All right, so make sure that the, the selection connects to another seam. Do the same thing on the other side. Actually, I should be able to just, whoops, let me select this bottom edge. Oh, look at that, I missed an edge. All right, so I can select these edges, there we go. And then also use the select mirror, goes to the other side, but also in the Y direction. Excellent, so Control E, mark these seams. Oh, it didn't do. Must not have done symmetry in X. Oh, you can't do, ah, I got it. I accidentally, I should have hold, held shift and click on the X. There we go. Now control E, mark the seam. Now this is a perfect layout because everything is, is entirely blue. Um, so since this is a key part of the model, like a, a more focal point of the model, it might be worth it to leave, to leave these seams. But also like seams are a bad thing because when you start texture painting seams can be they can just cause problems whenever you're painting i don't know how to explain that without it showing it to you but typically when you're uv when you're uving your model you don't want more you more you don't want more seams than is absolutely necessary um, so oftentimes you know if uh, i might choose to not cut those seams and leave it connected like this because it's it's less seams to cause problems in the texture but for this example, I think I will leave the seams because I like that that's a perfect layout. And we'll move on to the blade. Now this is gonna be extremely simple to lay out because it's it's not much more than a flat object um, with two sides. So we just need to cut a seam down the entire edge of the blade. So to do this, make sure that I have the bottom of the blade selected and I'm just holding control. Alt won't really work because it's going to stop whenever it gets to a, a, a triangle or something that that interrupts the quad flow. Um, I mean, it worked there, but uh, mostly I'm just going to hold control and click around the edge till I get to the other end. There we go. Control E, mark seam. Very, very easy to lay out this particular object. Um, now, um, you, you can definitely do this with, with the mesh entirely combined. You do not have to separate it. I think it helped for the demonstration purpose, but we I will combine them again, selecting them all, Control J, tabbing into edit mode. Our, our scales are completely wrong, like they're not re related to each other. So with everything selected in the UV image editor, I'll go to UV and average the island scale. Okay, so now they're all back to blue. Um, but I need to pack them, okay? So conceptually, you want all of your texture islands, your UV islands to, to be uh, positioned in this, in this grid. It's, it's referred to as the zero to one space, um, texture space, I think. If there are any other names for this grid, let me know. But um, you want your textures, you want your, sorry, you want your UV islands positioned inside the bounds of this grid. So if we go to UV with everything selected and choose pack islands, Blender will try its best to do that for you, but it's a very limited uh, tool. It doesn't, it's not really that great. In other words, there are a lot of, there's much better packing tools out there. I think even add-ons for Blender, but um, the, the built-in algorithm is not that great. It says you can enable rotation, but I don't know. It doesn't seem to, doesn't seem to rotate this very well. Let me see if I missed any questions real quick. Okay, I don't think I missed anything else. Is is uh, are you guys following along? Is this is this making sense? I hope I'm not confusing anybody, um, because again, you know, this is just the UV process. We haven't even started painting yet, but uh, I hope I hope you're all following with me. Um, 
So since the packing algorithm, uh, thank you, Jake. Since the packing algorithm is not that great, I'm gonna have to do this by hand, okay? To, uh, because my motivation here is to optimize what's called texel density. I'm pretty sure that's what most people call it. Um, uh, because we're going to create an image texture out of this zero to one space that's gonna fit over top of our, our model, our, our UVs. And so we want to, we want our texture information to cover as much of the image as possible, meaning this negative space in the grid is total waste, like it's it's useless. And so we will be wasting file space, we'll be, we'll be in, creating an inefficient model texture relationship. And so uh, I want to maximize this. And the way that I'm gonna do, or how I like to do it, is uh, I'm gonna control space to maximize this particular view. Control L to, oh, that's right. Control L does not work with this enabled. The, the UV 3D um, vis, uh, viewport sync. So I'm gonna turn that off and then go back, make sure I have everything selected on the mesh, uh, in Ed mesh edit mode. Go back to this and what I'm gonna do is select the blade. This is the longest, uh, thinnest portion of the UV. And I'm going to rotate 90 degrees and put this alongside the other one. All right, just like this. Now I'm gonna take both of them and I know that the optimal position for a long, thin shape like this is from corner to corner. You know, it's like you, uh, the way you measure a, a screen, a display on your phone or a TV, you go from corner to corner. So I'm going to rotate this about 45 degrees and you can see just how much room I can expand. Um, so I'm going to select everything because I want to maintain scale relationship and scale this up with the S key, move it into position. I want the UV islands to just fit within the border of the grid space, right? Um, so this looks pretty good. And now I'm just gonna move the, the handle, place it over here. I'm gonna put the related pieces of the handle. So the pommel and that little uh, circle cap that we cut off. I'm gonna move them over here too. Now for this particular model, it, it has it's very long and thin and so it's, you know, we're gonna have some wasted space. Oh, uh, oh, the keys are not shown, thank you. Duh, oh, the screencast keys doesn't even work in the UV editor. It's not showing up here. It is, okay, I guess the screencast keys only works in the 3D editor. Has it always been this limited? I didn't know that. So I guess I need to come up with another solution for showing hotkeys. If anyone has any suggestions on that, let me know because I've always used that that screencast keys, and apparently that's not not the ideal solution. All right, and that only leaves the the cross guard. Okay, so I was saying that since this is a very long, thin model, um, it's not going to be you know we're going to have wasted space, but at least I've limited the, the wasted space as optimally as possible. I guess you could maybe cut the you could start to cut up the blade a bit so that you don't have one long, really thin object, but I don't think that's really necessary in this case. Save, thank you. File save as sword number three. Save police, thank you. Um, best UV representation, Omar, I'm gonna check this out because I'm always on the lookout for how to better explain UVs. Yeah. This is a great explanation. I should have, I should have, I wish I had shown this at the beginning. Great explanation of how, like on the left, this is a texture, a UV version of your model. And then this wrapper is, is applied to the 3D model. Nice job, Omar, very good example. Uh, where were we? And um, so yeah, I, I was saying that for the sword, this is gonna be fine for, for our purposes. It could be more optimal, but again, it can be fine for this. Um, question from Matthew, would you be able to show us an example of a poorly unwrapped texture model? <laughs> yes. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if, it, I don't mean to be <laughs> kind of silly about this, but you, a smart UV project? Um, this isn't, this could be a lot worse, but what I do not like about the smart UV project is that for the blade, it does fine. 
but for and for the cross guard it does pretty good too but for all these little pieces i don't like it when my uvs i can't make a visual connection to my uvs in the 3d model so if i undo this like i know that these two objects are the blade or these two islands are the blade and this is the cross guard this is the handle i've kind of organized my uv layout to be intuitive to me as the artist um, especially when you get to more complex objects like a character with clothing. I, I can't stand when I'm, when I uh, like have the, the head island in the upper left, but then the ear is like off in the bottom right corner among all the clothes. I just like to visually organize. I'm talking preference here. It's not a requirement. Um, you really could get along fine using the UV project. Like this will work in a pinch. And when I'm working quick and dirty, I, I'll, I'll use it. But um, that's not a great layout. Even worse is if I apply a cylinder projection. <laughs> Obviously, this is really, really bad. You've got overlapping UVs, very stretched UVs. Um, I mean, you can just go through the list here. Spherical projection, awful. Um, yeah, so maybe that's not really answering your question. Um, I mean, yeah, along the way, even when I, before I laid all these out, let me save real quick in case I have to um, jump back here. But before I laid everything out by hand, I'm not going to get there. Whenever I, whenever the swords were, were left and right perpendicular and there was all that wasted space, like that's just an example of a bad layout. You don't want that much empty space. But uh, I don't have an example off the top of my head for... I've never actually done that. Look for a model with a bad set of UVs. I'm sure one of my first models would be a great example. Um, let's go back. Um, let me check question. So it's it's not poorly unwrapping to use Smart Project, just not efficient. Let's see. If I were to... It's not a great practice. It's okay. It's okay, but it is quick and dirty. So there, it has a higher potential for problems to creep up after the fact. And I'm going to show you a potential problem whenever we, whenever I start painting, which should be basically right now. What is this thing down here? What is that? Let me, okay. I don't know. Here's some troubleshooting. If you have some islands that you don't really know what's going on, enable the UV sync selection button. And you can click on these uh, components and then go find them. Ah, okay, right there. So that is the issue. Ah, that's silly. That was just a stupid mistake on my part. So yeah, these seams are unnecessary. Control E, clear seam. Ah, but that ruined the whole. Okay, okay. You're seeing some live troubleshooting. What I'm trying to do is clear those seams because it creates these ugly little triangles off to themselves. That's that's just kind of a, a poor UV layout. So I want to fix the seam, but whenever I change any seams, it automatically unwraps and it ruins what I've already positioned. So I'm going to turn off UV live unwrap in both 3D and 2D. UV live unwrap. I'm going to control E, clear the seam, and then only select the cross guard. Control E, I mean, uh, U unwrap. Okay. Oh, we still have, ah, because on the other side, remember I mirrored it. I mirrored the selection. So I also have a UV, a couple UV seams here that are worthless. Select the crossbar, you unwrap, and I want to position this where it was. Ah, I need to turn off UV selection sync now because it won't let me select the island. I really wish it could do that. I don't know why that's such a limitation, but now I've got this. And when I scale, the way I can know if I'm in the proper scale uh, relationship is if I scale and it turns blue and everything else stays blue. All right. I don't want to adjust the other islands because, um, yeah, because I, I position them correctly. Sorry, brain fart. 
Um, now, if you're thinking to yourself, well, since I've got all this wasted space, can I just scale these islands up so it takes up more space? That's, I mean, you could do that, but I find that all your pixel densities will be consistent if we leave them all blue. And for this particular model, I think that's worth it. Sometimes in a character, you know, if the face is more important, um, I might scale those UVs up a little bit. I have done that before, definitely, but but I'm I'm kind of balancing it out that the uv is the uv layout process is definitely a game weighing the pros and cons where is stretching okay where are seams okay where is uh empty space more important than um than more uv islands these kind of questions so anyway overall this is really a simple model to unwrap i just took i don't know like an hour to explain that stuff probably like 40 minutes so now we've unwrapped it and we're ready to start painting finally the, the actual prize let's put color on this model i'm going to save the model and uh, i fixed those those extraneous polygons that got separated uh, unintentionally and we are ready to create a texture um, let me make sure i don't I haven't missed any questions question ignore this uh, if Eric Sharp, can I create a PNG image with alpha of the UV layout? I would like to use it to create details in Photoshop, such as a chord pattern to overlay uh, my Blender texture painting. Yes, if you want. Uh, okay, that's that's a good question. Back in the day, before 3D painting really caught on in the techno technology advanced, meaning that we can paint on the 3D model and the UVs like accept that, translate that paint information automatically. You typically exported your mesh UV layout into Photoshop or some painting program and painted by hand. That's how I started to learn. And I didn't know about this tool, but UV um, export UV layout. All right, this will create a PNG image as big as you want it. If you want 1024, 2048, whatever. You have some fill opacity options, but this will create an image. Let me just save it out. Um, or just in case I need it. Um, I usually call it UV snapshot, but anyway, um, export the UV layout. And then if I open this, and uh, I think I should be able to open it here. Let me turn, let me go to the, switch this to the image editor so I don't have the UVs. And you can see what that spits out. So you have, it's like the perfect template for being able, to, being able to paint in Photoshop. And you've got some opacity information where the UV islands are, are, less, opa are, are less transparent than the surrounding zero um, negative space. So this is what I recommend. It's a really, really clever tool. But if you can imagine when I was learning all this stuff with 3ds Max, it has a similar tool. I didn't know about it. And so I was literally, I had Microsoft Paint at the time on one side of my computer screen the 3D model on the left side, and I would visually like like um, create polygons in paint to match my UV islands. And if I got, and I would just gradually get close, but like literally transposing by hand, it was it was silly. I hated texture painting when I started because I didn't didn't really know how to do it properly. Anyway, story time's over. Let's uh, uh, the UV layout. If you want to uh, edit textures externally, it's a very important thing to know about. Back to the UV editor, and I don't need to see this image anymore. All right, so we're ready to create our actual texture. We need to create the texture. So that, that's profound advice. Um, I'm going to create, uh, you can do that a couple ways, but at this point, whenever we get into the texture painting process, I strongly recommend dragging up another um, UI window and switching this to the shader editor. Um, I, it's just going to be important to know how your texture is plugged into your material. Uh, certainly the more advanced you get into your texture creation, that becomes very important. I kind of wish it was there by default in the texture paint. Oh, we're not there yet. Um, I should have done that. So if you switch to texture paint, it's pretty much the exact same. Um, but I wish they included the shader editor because I think there's very important information that you need to be aware of. Tobles, if I remember correctly in the texture pancake hobo video you put the duplicate parts above each other why not this time oh yeah duplicate parts 
because I don't think there is any duplicate parts in this model. If we go back to UV editing, the blade is unique, as in, I, I well, actually, yeah, it is unique. If you look at this, um, it's not the same from front to back of the blade. So this nick has a little bit more detail on the other side. And as soon as one thing is not symmetrical, you can't really lay over the UVs. But yeah, that's a technique too, if you want, uh, if you want the same, if you want, uh, for example, how do I say this quickly? Um, if you want the left side of the cross guard to look the same as the right side, but you already applied your mirror modifier, you could cut a seam down the middle, for example, and just lay those two um, islands on top of each other. Then when I paint, they're going to inherit the exact same color information. So you're two for the price of one kind of situation. Um, here, I, I the reason I'm not doing that here, the big reason is I want to preserve the ability to, to paint asymmetrically. Um, and since this is a pretty simple model, asymmetry is not that big of a hassle to deal with. Um, all right, so yeah, I wanna get back to, I uh, wanna get to texture painting. That's the reward at the, at the end of the, the UV um, tunnel. Um, so you can create a texture a few different ways. Uh, you can do it in the shader editor, but um, I'm gonna do it in the in the UV editor just by clicking the new button. And we can. I'm gonna create it 2048. Again, I like to create bigger, and if I want to scale down, I can, but I, I like to, to just start bigger. Um, 2048, and I'm gonna name this sword underscore color. This is, we're only gonna be painting a color texture I'm trying to keep that simple for if this is your first time. You know, you can get really complex and paint all sorts of textures, uh, but I'm just going to use the color and um, and show you how to manipulate that to be to control things like reflectivity, um, especially. So anyway, keep it simple to just with just the one uh, color texture. Uh, I'm going to leave the color at black because it doesn't really matter. And in this situation, um, okay, I think that's it. We will click OK. And we've created a texture, but why is it not showing up in, in the viewport? And why is the viewport showing pink? Anytime you see this hot pink color appear in Blender, whether it's for a texture that's missing or, or your render has a hot pink element that you know you didn't texture anything hot pink, um, it's, it's Blender giving you a soft warning. It's saying that I am, tr I am sourcing a texture somewhere, but I, I have lost the path to that texture. And that's what's happening here. Um, because if I start painting, you'll get a warning that says missing materials and textures detected. So in order to paint in, in Blender, you need to have a material and you need to have a texture assigned to it. So just creating the texture does not create the association. Um, to create the association, let's create a material. You can also do this multiple places in the shader editor, but also in the material editor in the properties panel. You can create new, I'm gonna call this sword, just sword for now. Um, just, it'll start as one material, but eventually I'll have multiple. And then in the base color slot, this is where we want the texture to, to live, to be plugged into. So this little circle icon we can click and I can choose image texture. And then finally choose the rec sword, no, no, uh, the sword color. I should actually probably call this rec sword color just to differentiate for myself that this is the recorded version, not the rehearsal version. And excellent. So now we can see the pink disappears and we don't get that error anymore when we paint because we don't have any missing texture association. Someone was asking in the, ch in the chat at the beginning of the stream why they kept getting that. So hopefully that answered your question. Um, but uh, you know, Blender, again, I mentioned that Blender, I don't think has the most intuitive texture painting workflow. Uh, it has all the tools, I think, but the vast majority of tools that you would need to, to create whatever you wanted texture wise, but, um, it's just not that intuitive case in point being you create, you go to texture paint mode and it's giving you these errors. Like, why is my sword pink? What's going on here? Um, so it's, it's important to know a couple little, uh, tricks or, or gotchas, I guess. Um, let me answer some questions. Concrescence, is there an action, actions per minute scene in modeling? Like who can make something with the least keystrokes? Uh, I've seen, 
I've seen like competitions sort of spark up friendly competitions of like who can model faster or or who can do it with the who can create the best model with the fewest amount of polygons. Um, it'd be a fun challenge to do, I think, you know, through the if we did an official CG cookie challenge to to like like time yourself. You have to record a video and, you know, no shenanigans, but like show yourself modeling how quickly you do it. That'd be kind of fun because the exercise being like becoming more efficient as a modeler. I know that when I was, I was always proud when I worked at a studio because I developed a reputation for being pretty fast. And, and you know, that was, I don't know, just competitively, like you want to be the most efficient. Uh, that's a, an asset to have in your, in your skills, I guess. Anyway, um, notice how nicely <laughs> I name stuff. Um, I try to name things well. As you can see, we've got the sword named Plane 01. This should probably be called Sword. <laughs> but yeah, I, I'm a big believer in naming your your stuff and your scene um, well because that's that's always gonna it's always better to be more organized than less organized. But um, I'm rarely that good at it. But but try strive to be organized and name stuff properly. Let me save let me save my scene. And also, this brings up another point. Whenever you create a texture, it only exists in RAM. This get, this trips a lot of people up. Because textures are are supposed to be external files, Blender expects it to be external. So if I I'll, I should be able to just demonstrate this quickly. If I paint my texture, I Control S to save the file, and then let's just create a new file. Oh, it gives you the warning, so the demo doesn't really work. It's telling you that the file has unsaved changes, specifically one modified image. That's a, that's a nice updated 2.8 uh, that it gives you that warning. It used to not give that warning. And so pretend that warning wasn't there. You discard the changes and then you the next day you open up that file. Oh no, where's my texture? Where's my white stroke? Like that's gone. Because when you paint in, in Blender, it's, it's only loaded into RAM and you need to save that file externally. So I need to image uh, save as, let's go to texture and I'll just leave it rec sword color. I'm going to call, I'm just going to leave it as a RGB PNG, save as image. Okay, now that image is saved and any strokes that I make, I can go, you'll see the little asterisk appear uh, and that means changes exist. So I need to save if I want. Now for me, I don't, I don't want to save those changes. So I will just reload the image and get back to, to pure black. But yeah, trips a lot of people up when they start texture painting, the fact that you need to save the image. Um, oh, okay, so you already figured it out, Tebow. I gotcha. Um, hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. All right, so on to texture painting. The, the, just like modeling and pretty much anything I, I, I build in 3D especially, uh, I need to start simple and then kind of treat it in stages. Stage one is, is simple block out, just like we, we did when we modeled. You know, create a simple cylinder, create a simple cube, and then gradually add more detail. Same thing with texture painting. I'm gonna start with simple broad colors and then drill down each stage and, and add details as I go. So to the first step is painting broad colors. Um, and to do that, we are going to use, in texture paint mode, I wanna use the fill brush. All right, so this takes us to the 3D view and the, the key thing to be uh, knowledgeable about here is this is that, that uh, what is it called? The toolbar, I think, technically. If you right click uh, anywhere up here, any menus, you can go to header, uh, show tool settings, I guess is what it's called now. And that I think by default is, is not there. So you wanna be aware of it. Maybe for the texture paint workspace, it's visible. I take that back. Header, show tool settings. So up here, you've got your color for your brush or, or, or uh, anything over here, your strength. You've got the mixture type. Uh, various menus. Uh, you've actually got a lot going on up here. Um, if you've used Blender before, you're you're familiar with these settings, but you haven't seen them in the the horizontal layout. If you want the vertical layout, you can click on this panel, uh, the the Active Tool and Workspace settings. So if we click on that, you'll get the more traditional Blender uh, vertical layout of your colors. You've got your color palettes available here, which are not available up top. I don't think. Oh, they are available in the brush menu. Okay. Anyway, so these are kind of duplicate settings depending on how you want to work. Um, but for the fill, you know, this is where I want to, let's just take, for example, the blade. It's going to be a gray type metal. So uh, we'll choose a gray color. It's just in our color wheel. 
Uh, I think that's probably pretty good. Maybe just slightly into the blue range. Often like truly black and white values can be kind of boring, but if you add just a touch of color, it's a little bit more uh, interesting. Okay, Tebow for English uh, speaking people, cool. There's another Tebow that's a, usually a regular around here. I don't think he's here now or here today, but um, uh, glad I pronounced that right. All right, so we've got the gray color for the blade. Now, how do I paint just the blade? Because if I click, the whole sword is gonna be gray. Um, also at that, it's not even full strength gray. By default, it's set to 0.5. I don't know why it's 0.5. Um, I don't know who wants to do that by default, but um, now set to one, there we go, we have full gray. But I only want the blade to be gray. Um, so, I mean, now I could, I guess, move on, but like, let's go over the selection painting uh, option. If you turn on this tool right here, paint mask or face selection masking for painting, this takes into account whatever we have selected in mesh edit mode. So if I tab into mesh edit mode, nothing is selected, therefore nothing can be painted. I'm clicking and nothing's happening. Um, I should, while I'm in the 3D view, let's turn on screencast keys and move them. Where are screencast keys? There they are. Okay. Um, Back to selection masking. So if I just select the blade portion, um, which I think I can do, I can use in edit mode, I can use the L hotkey. And yeah, so that selects the island, right? The, the, the part of the mesh that's uh, not connected to anything, which is my blade. So I can click and make that entirely gray. Um, then A is the same hotkey as mesh edit mode. Now I've, I've selected everything, hit A twice, I've deselected everything. Whenever you see the wireframe, that means nothing is selected. That's the way it kind of visualizes that. So if I select, hold or hold my uh, cursor over the crossbar, hit L. Now I can switch to a darker version of that bluish gray. That's going to be the color of the of the middle crossbar. By the way, where am I getting these colors from? It might make sense to um, pull out another UV uh, a UI element, and then I'll grab the image switch to the image editor and grab the image of the sword I've already created. You know me, big big fan of, of uh, reference. All right, so sword beauty. All right, so this is where I'm getting, um, I see my UVs and I don't want to see the UVs. Let's see, view, display texture UVs. Let's turn that off, there we go. So yeah, I'm looking at the sword the kind of color spectrum is it's that darker, it's a darker, slightly bluish gray for the, the pommel, the rings, and the cross guard. Then the blade has its own lighter color gray. And then inside the channel in the middle, that is a slightly darker gray. So that's kind of the color spectrum I'm working with. We'll leave that open so we can see what's going on there. If you got any questions, you know, for me to answer, make sure you put the, the question tag so I can see that uh, and identify it quickly. But if you're asking amongst yourselves, that's totally fine. All right, so uh, back to coloring these. Uh, if I go to, I need to color, well, let's just select the whole handle right now, L, and I'm gonna also color it that same gray, darker grayish blue. All right, so we filled that, but now the only, the remaining thing is, I guess there's a couple things. Uh, I need to select the leather portions, which is in between the rings. So to do this, I will tab to edit mode since the selections are synced. And let's just select the ring in the middle. All right, these are gonna be my, my leather portions and control uh, plus to grow the selection. All right, there we have all the leather selected. Back to uh, texture paint mode using the tab key and we just need a brown color. So move it to the orange spectrum, keep it dark. All right, and then click and color that. Excellent, whenever I'm done selection paint masking, oh, there was one more thing. I forgot about the middle channel. Let me uh, tab to edit mode, go to wireframe and edge mode specifically. 
I'm going to control click for this edge in the middle, then control space to grow my selection. And I think this is exactly what I want. Yes, perfect. All right, now back to texture paint mode. I want the light gray. Okay, the light gray color. Uh, yeah, so I need to color pick that. This is, this is actually not as intuitive as one would maybe hope, but I wanna select this color right here. To do that, I can, I can do it in the UV uh, editor because you can see that we've got the same paint settings up at the top. So I can click that brown and then click the, uh, what do you call it, the color picker. All right, now I can select that gray and I just need to alter it to be just slightly darker. All right, then click on the uh, model and I've colored in that information. Edge bleed, where is that found? Ah, I meant to go over this at the very beginning. Nuts. Thank you for reminding me. I really meant to go over this at the very beginning. Um, edge bleed is a pretty important setting that I think the default is set incorrectly that causes problems down the road. So all the way on the right side of our toolbar, you have options. It's also available at the bottom of the vertical menu. And you have a bleed value here. Now to discuss what bleed is, whenever you paint on UVs, the by default, you've got two pixels of bleed and that's where the color will be projected beyond the boundary of our UV island. Okay, you can see that right here. UV island ends, but there's still color information extending beyond. Um, that is called bleed. Now in my experience, two pixels is not really a safe value. I think you should at least have five pixels, if not 10 pixels, if you can spare it. And so now if I, um, let's see, if I convert, uh, I mean, control I to invert my selection, shift L to deselect the handle and crossbar, as well as the pommel. Oh, I forgot the pommel, I need to color that. So basically I'm coloring in the blade only. Let's one more time choose the uh, lighter gray color. Now if I click, you'll see that the, the paint is extended beyond the edge. Um, this, this means it's, this makes it safer. Um, if I, to, to demonstrate when it's unsafe, if I take the bleed value down to zero, and then let's go to our paint tool, choose a, a very bright color like uh, bright pink purple. Eh, let's do green. <laughs> Blender has reserved the bright pink purple. Um, and if I paint on this edge, remember there is a seam right here. All right, now if I go to the other side and paint a bright red or orange, make sure I'm touching, and we look at, okay, you can see where that's connecting. Um, the problem becomes the pixelation of the texture creates this jagged edge along the seam. And so if we look really close, let me, uh, let me turn on flat shading. Ah, uh, you can't really see it, but there's a sliver. There's going to be little specks of gray right along that seam. I wonder if I, maybe if I paint both, uh, orange, that'll be easier to see. There we go, that is easier to see. Can you see that? Just a little bit of, of gray. Actually, if I paint it black, that will be really noticeable. All right, so I should be painting right on that seam, but no matter what I do, that seam never goes away. This is where bleed becomes crucial. And at two pixels, I, I see this happen negatively more than, more than is desired. Um, sometimes with two pixels, it can happen. So I recommend upping that to like five. And now when I paint there, it goes away and the extension outside of the boundary is what fixes that. Um, so that, yeah, the, the where to find those pixel values, the, the, the bleed value is in options. You can find it in the vertical version or the horizontal. Honestly, I try, I still am trying to get in, in the habit of changing that immediately whenever I start texture painting to prevent kind of issues. And honestly, I'm afraid I'll need to, I'll need to do that now as well, or at least on the, the, other, the other objects. So let me uh, uh, 
get rid of these values, these these uh, demonstration strokes, and uh, go back to fill. And I still use the light gray. There we go. All right, so that's gone. I need to select the cross guard. And um, I need to select this, this color picker. Now, in the 3D view, you have the S hotkey. So if I hold S and then move my, my cursor around, which has become the eyedropper, we are now selecting a different color. And I'm going to hold it over the dark gray and let go. I don't need to click. And now that will become my new color for filling. The whole reason I'm doing this filling again is to get the extension outside of the boundaries. Um, now, when you have when you have two colors butting up to each other, but it's not a seam, that's okay. Uh, you, the bleed value doesn't have an effect there. It's only where there are UV seams. And so, how am I going to select? Oh, another thing to keep in mind: the when I'm in texture paint mode, the L key is the select the UV island it by default will will stop where there's a UV seam. So if I hit L, you'll notice it only selects um, uh, up until the cap. And that's because it's respect, excuse me, it's respecting the fact that there's a UV seam there. Pretty handy actually. So let me uh, grow the selection. Okay, grow selection does not work in texture paint mode. So let's go back to edit mode, hitting the tab key and then control space to grow the selection. All I'm doing here is, whoops, switch to face select. This is not the most efficient way to make this selection, but I'm just gonna do it. Uh. All right, and then fill this one more time with the dark gray uh, color. All right, so we've got um, the base colors established. I can turn off selection syncing. Um, now we're ready to actually make this more interesting. Anybody can kind of do this. And hopefully, once I show you my, my painting skills, you'll think you can you will be able to do it too. Because I am not a gifted painter. I love the hand-painted look, but it's I've never just spent too much time painting and developing those skills. So I kind of fast track it and, and do basic painting. So if that's you, this is gonna be perfect. Save, 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 save. Yes, image. I'm going to save the texture first and really saving the scene doesn't have too much of an effect because I'm only really focusing on the texture at this point, but it's better th to be safe than sorry. I'm gonna go ahead and save that scene. Uh, question, when it comes to very specific details like the very small forging details that mark lines, um, let's say a katana blade, for example. Uh, yeah, your katana blade is awesome, by the way. Um, shouldn't this go into texturing of the shading in week three? Um, I don't think so. By the end of today's stream, I'm only going to paint the texture itself. I'm not going to go into any shading information. Um, I'm also, if you're if you're thinking about the treasure chest, I'm also not going to, I might, but I'm not planning on baking the edge detection, like uh, work, uh, workflow. I'm just going to hand paint the edges. Um, so in that way, I'm not actually getting into shading information yet. Um, even though I did tell you to drag this out, shading is important, but for the sake of the stream organization, I am separating them. Um, edge bleed. Okay, so I'm ready to start painting. I'm going to switch over to my tablet. So I've got my little Wacom pen. And uh, real quick, someone did ask how I set up my Wacom pen. So just in case you're wondering, I try and keep things uh, very standard. So my pin, the lower button is middle mouse for me. Upper button is right mouse, which I think is by de is the default. And then t uh, touching the surface is left click. Uh, so I don't have any hotkeys on the tablet itself set up. So the only custom thing I did was make the bottom button middle mouse, in case that helps you. Um, but that way it basically serves as a, a mouse, like it works the exact same way as a mouse. So middle mouse clicking, I can orbit around the viewport. Um, let's start painting. Whoops, didn't mean to do that. Uh, I'm trying to move. There we go. Um, all right. How I like to paint, the next level for me is, is varying up the tones in the color. Using the color that's already there, but making a variety of tones, whether it's slightly darker, slightly lighter. Um, and to do this, I'm going to choose my brush tool. 
and by uh, if I use the black if I use the black color, this is this can be a general darkening of the of the the underlying color, especially if I choose the overlay mix type. All right, so now I'm going to I should go over the hotkeys. Um, F is the size of your brush. Hitting F and then dragging your mouse will increase or decrease the size. Shift F is the strength of the brush. So drag it closer, you'll see that the color gets more and more um, opaque. Drag it out and it gets more and more transparent. All right, that's how you control the strength of your brush. So you'll see me doing that a lot, whether it's the size or the strength, I'll just do that very quickly. Um, any other hotkeys to be aware of? I don't, not quite yet, but those are the two big ones. Now, um, I switch to overlay mode, and if I start drawing on the surface, you'll see that it's taking the existing color and darkening it, but also like giving it a little more saturation. So this works great if I want to paint, you know, in the crevices, for example, some sort of ambient occlusion, a little bit of dirt and grime is gathered. Um, that makes sense. But um, as I paint, you'll also notice that we're getting some, not issues, but things to be aware of. For example, if I look on the backside, none of that has made it to the backside. By default, if we go over to the options, and by the way, if any of this is too fast or not making sense, I went over this in detail, these same things arguably more efficiently in the treasure chest course. Um, so definitely check that out for further, arguably better reference maybe. Um, Pre-recorded rehearse being better than live. Um, and let me undo that. So to control if the paint stroke goes through the object or not, in the options where you say, where you find the bleed, you have this occlude and back face culling option. If I turn those off, then I will get, if I go to the one view, um, I will get the same effect on both sides, all right? There is one more setting though to be aware of. If you go to the fall off option, normal fall off is on by default, it's, uh, I go over an explanation of exactly what this is doing in the treasure chest course. I'm gonna try and speed up for the next 20 minutes. So go check that out if you if you wanna know what this does, um, but I'm just I'm gonna tell you to turn it off. It's not really that useful, especially for an object like this. Uh, for more round objects, spherical objects, it's helpful, but not for this. Now, I've got that set up and I'm going to re-enable selection masking because I just wanna focus on one object at a time. So double hit A to get no, nothing selected, L to select uh, the blade, all right? So with the blade selected, looked kind of weird, um, had the wireframe bit in there, it's kind of strange. Uh, what I'm gonna do here, if we look at the example, um, oh, it switched, I want this to be Sword Beauty. Now if I wanna leave this image here, it's a little pro tip, you can pin the image with this thumbtack icon. Okay, so now for some reason it switched over to the texture. Um, so now this will definitely stay there. But if you can look closely, there is darkening that I put in the bottom, kind of where these, the blade meets the crossbar, because my thinking is that um, that's gonna be the, less, the least used portion of the blade. You know, the, the tip is gonna get the most, the tip and edges are gonna get the most wear and tear, but more dust and grime is gonna to gather towards the base. So I'm going to slowly drag out a darkening effect towards the bottom of the blade. And um, if you don't like the wireframe view, you know, you can disable overlays and so you can paint uh, more clearly. All right, so we've darkened the base. Maybe we wanna add a little bit of dirt, like, like a dark uh, brown color. So instead of overlay, let me switch back to mix and change the color to be slightly brown. I'm gonna keep this very subtle and just add a little bit of brown sp uh, splotches, basically. Maybe darken it a little bit. All right, this is where you can have fun. You can start to project a story onto this. You know, when I say story, I don't mean once upon a time, this character was introduced, this conflict happened, the wizard showed up, and happily ever after. I don't mean that, but I mean, in a lot of ways, the history of this object. So if this is not a brand new sword, it's got dents and dings, let's give some reason to this. It's gonna be out in the wild, you know, it's gonna have seen battle, there's gonna maybe be some blood kind of dried that's that's dripped down to this, this area. So it makes sense to add dirt and grime. Um, 
And uh, let's see, what else specifically to the blade? Well, I'm not gonna get to the edges quite yet. I wanna just focus on darkening the crevices essentially. So I've I've done that, you know, added some, some grime, but I wanna darken specifically very concentrated to, to create some ambient occlusion. So I'm gonna go back to the darkening. I'll leave it brown and just uh, maybe change the mix type to multiply, which is just a strict darkening. And then concentrate right there where it connects. That might look a little strange right now. Ooh. Did you notice the darkening did not make it to the other side? Why? I have occlude and backface turned off. Oh, oh, I know why. Again, I, th I think this harkens back to the fact that I don't think Blender is terribly intuitive. Th like whenever I, I uh, turn my overlays off, remember, so this shows selection masking, but the problem with seeing selection masking is I don't, I can't paint the true color whenever I've got a wireframe over top. It's just distracting. It's not authentic. So I turned that off to paint authentically, but I forgot that I didn't, I needed to select the backside too. So yeah, you just gotta be aware whenever you're texture painting, you need to be aware of these things. Uh, there's a lot of settings to be aware of basically and, it, and it's less intuitive. So let me, um, I think what I'm gonna do is just reload the image. I haven't done that much work yet. Let me reload the image and make sure that I have the backside selected as well. There we go, both sides selected. I'm gonna turn off my overlay so I can paint authentically. And I'm going to darken. I'm gonna use a, I'm gonna use just a black color to darken with overlay. The reason I'm using overlay is I want to take the existing color, darken it and make it more saturated. That's what overlay does with a, with a black input. All right, so I'm darkening the base. Why dark, maybe another question, why darken the base at all? With hand-painted textures, I'm a big proponent of gradients, all right? So you see a gradient from darker to lighter. I strongly recommend you do that um, at, the, at the early stages of painting, uh, really because it's just, it's good painting um, workflow. Like gradients are way more appealing than when the whole thing is a solid color. And you'll see this develop as I paint, but uh, yeah, gradients is the key. So I've painted the front and back, excellent. I can go back to adding the dirt. So a lighter brown color. Let's just make it mix, which is not, which is just adding the pure brown color. That's what, what the mix uh, uh, blend mode does. I'm just gonna add a little bit in here. You know, maybe make it slightly red if we wanted it to be blood. You know, it depends on how gruesome you wanna be. All right, but that's being projected on the front and back side now that I have both selected. Um, so back to, I'm back to where we were. I'm painting dark in the crevices only to represent some ambient occlusion. I'm gonna, I guess mix is fine, but um, I really wanna concentrate it right on the edge. All right, it might look weird butting up to the other uh, object, the uh, crossbar, but I'm going to add the same darkness there too. So let's do that now. I'm going to turn on my overlays, deselect everything, just select the crossbar. And you can see just how like annoying that is that when I paint black, it's not the true color next to the blade. So I wanna turn that off for authentic color representation and um, Oh, what was I doing? Yeah, so I'm adding the darkness. Now, at this point, I do want to respect occlusion, right? I don't want to paint this stroke and it ends up down here randomly. That's not what I want. So let me instead enable occlude and backface culling. And before I add the tight ambient occlusion, let's uh, make it a little more broad. I'm going to slowly darken towards the 
where the blade connects. And then add the darker ambient occlusion. Want to make this gradual. Don't want it to be super stark, but uh, adding the darkness to both surfaces will make them blend together much, much better. All right, now they're going to feel like the blade is set into the metal just by a texture. It's really quite powerful, um, you know, if you practice this. So let me save the image, save our texture, because I do like where this is at. Um, let me see if I missed anything. Oh no, first strike, what did I do? For my blade, I turned on... Oh, that's your first strike, yeah, yeah. So if I mess up too much, is that what maybe you're referring to? If I mess up too much, you guys should just bail and not, not pay attention to me. Um, yeah, I agree. Uh, so let's, uh, we darken the top, let's treat it the same way. Anytime you have two like uh, pieces of your model coming together, it's gonna make sense to darken it, especially if it has any age to it. So um, darkening around the blade, I mean the uh, handle certainly is gonna make sense. Keeping it broad at first, making sure. Okay, so this is something to keep in mind. If I if I make too many strokes with occlusion on, you're gonna see that it, it cuts off right there at the harsh 90 degree angle. The reason being um, is it can't project to the other side. So you know maybe maybe it's better to actually enable to disable these and maybe i'm trying to think could i do it from the front view now nah, that doesn't really work maybe i'll just kind of do it by hand and just be careful how much i'm projecting onto the other side okay the reason i'm doing it like this is i don't want the 90 degree uh, angles on the edges there we go now it's, it's very consistent texture being projected all the way through then uh, for the tight ambient occlusion, right around the edge, uh, I'm going to switch on occlusion and culling. This also is a good opportunity to maybe enable uh, X symmetry or even X and Y symmetry because this model does have that. And I can just paint on one quadrant and it's automatically added to the rest of it. All right, so making this tight darkness, uh, ambient occlusion is gonna, again, make this handle feel like it's really connected to the hilt, to the, uh, the hilt, the uh, cross guard. So if you, if you kind of zoom back, very little complex painting has happened, right? Base colors, now I'm adding second layers of pretty broad strokes, you know, darkness around the crevices. You can also add lightness too. Um, I haven't done that yet, but if I switch my color to white, and change it back to overlay. Again, overlay, I use that anytime I want to take the existing color and either darken, saturate it, or brighten, saturate it. All right, so now if I make the, the strength really subtle, let me turn off um, symmetry. Again, this is where I wanna break up symmetry. So, uh, you know, I can just, I, I like to randomly touch the color, just make little strokes and, um, and it, it breaks up the monotony of the, 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 the base colors that I started with. So I can do the same thing up at the, uh, I wanna do it on the blade, but I have selection masking enabled. Let's just turn that off. All right, same kind of thing, just lightening certain parts of it. All right, Ver uh, in reality and in hand-painted textures, variety of tones is important. You don't wanna just see a solid block of color. It's uh, pretty boring. So. Uh, I'm going to switch now to the dark, or it's actually already there. So uh, in the vertical color, color selector, and then also maybe in the brush menu, you've got two slots. If you want to switch between them, just hold control. And now I'm going to be darkening as I hold control. So this is good. I like to touch both. I like to, um, I've created, I've created the harsh edges, which I didn't want. I think because I have occlude and culling enabled. Bummer. Um, anyway, it's not that big of a deal, but I'm going to, for each color, I like to touch a little bit lighter chain, you know, kind of do random splotch patterns for a little bit lighter and a little bit darker. That's kind of how, how I approach the painting hand painted texture process. Yeah. I've really kind of created a problem. This is, this is what I wanted to avoid. Um, but 
but you know you need to really be on top of when do I have occlusion and backface culling enabled. Uh, yeah, so it's unfortunate. I think there's there's a uh, much room to develop for how intuitive texture painting is in Blender, but. Here, so how am I gonna fix this? One way that you can fix this is perhaps with the smear brush. That can be really useful because it takes the information that's there and I can kind of just smear and blur it in a direction of my brush stroke. It's actually working really well. Make it really strong too. There we go. You can actually like drag it over here. I did this in the in the wood wood painting for the for the treasure chest as well. Maybe here I will drag it out. All right, there we go. We've got some different, some variations in the metal. I need to carry this down into our, the handle of the leather. Let's see what time is it? Ah, uh, just a few more minutes left. Let me save the image. Am I missing any questions? From Toss, uh, would it be better to, to bevel edges of the handle before painting them, or are you going to bevel them once you move to vertex paint? Um, would it be better to bevel the edges? So if you're if you're referring to the technique I showed in the in the treasure chest course, I'm actually not going to use that one. You definitely can use it, but for this, I wanted to just hand paint the edge detection, which I'm going to move into pretty soon. Um, I if I, I think that's what you're referring to. Correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. Uh, trying to scroll down. Question: How dangerous is it for my grade if I put a huge focus on the blade only for texturing? Um, I mean, I would love to see you do everything. It would just be kind of like incomplete. I guess I would probably grade on incompleteness, but maybe if you can explain in your thread why only focus on the blade, I, I'm I'm open to hearing uh, whatever. Question, when you added paint to the blade, it was symmetrical from one side to the other. Would it be better to avoid symmetry? Uh, yeah, I think I kind of went over that um, probably since you asked the question. Sorry, I'm late to answering that. But I do like for the for the splotchy patterns that I'm talking about that I'm adding, um, the dirt patterns, like I do like to keep them asymmetrical. It's just an easy way to add asymmetry. Um, okay, I think I'm not gonna maybe finish the texture entirely. I'm pretty close. I mean, uh, maybe I can stop talking as much and actually, let me try that first. Just take a couple minutes to paint the leather. Um, I shouldn't need to actually select it. Maybe I could, let me think of the best way to do this. Okay, I, I will, I think, turn on selection masking. Just select the handle. And yeah, okay. Turn off overlays. Let's start... Oh, I should use the symmetry maybe here. For specifically darkening, I will use X and Y symmetry. That way I can just focus, make sure my occlusion is turned on. All right, so I've got my black and white, I believe. I'm using smear, black and white, there we go. All right, so I'm going to, a little bit of gray came off of the, of the it came off onto the leather. I think that's okay though. All right, so I'm going to darken around these areas. And yeah, the symmetry is going to help here because I don't have to go around the entire cylinder each time. So I'm just focusing on a quadrant. For the tight ambient occlusion, I will use symmetry, but then I'll turn symmetry off once I get to the more broad darkening. All right, so I'm holding control since that's my second color slot. I'm just going to go down. There we go. All right, almost done. Hmm, so I cannot, here's a problem that can come up when texture painting. I want to paint in the crevices of this color, but it's all the same color. So how do I then only, like how do I visually understand where I'm painting? Um, you can turn on wireframe, I suppose. So I'm gonna re-enable, um, okay, so I've got my overlays enabled, and then if I turn on wireframe, yeah, that can help. So now it's a little distracting to see the orange, but like it's necessary for me to paint 
in that crevice specifically. You can see me making a bigger brush, a smaller brush. I really do want there to be a pretty tight, dark darkness in the very center of the crevice. All right, let's turn off overlays. How's that looking? All right, good for the tight ambient occlusion. Now I'm gonna, gonna scope out a little bit and do the, the broader darkening. For this, uh, I guess I'll keep symmetry enabled because it's going to be pretty subtle overall. Um, what I don't like about this is I'm darkening the gray, the metal pieces way too much. Let me undo. And so for this, I guess I will just select, go ahead and select, I think bite the bullet, tab into edit mode, and go ahead and select just the leather portions. All right, tab back to uh, uh, texture paint mode, disable my overlays. And now I will only be texture painting on the leather. I won't be darkening the uh, metal unnecessarily. Ah, okay, so you can see here where the seam is starting to make itself apparent. So I need to just, I think that's where the seam is. Oh no, that's not where the seam is. That must have just been my, my. Uh... yeah, it must have just been my occlusion. Um, I, uh, so really, I guess this, it would make maybe more sense to turn occlusion off in this case. Cause I, you can see where, where like, we're getting a stark line right there. And I definitely don't want that. I can always jump over to smear and maybe smear that out. There we go. We do not like seams and sharp lines being detectable. All right, there we go. So we've got some nice leather age involved. You know, maybe if it's got a little bit too dark Maybe I can put white in the middle, like I've got my white color now. That's kind of adding a little bit of lightness and variation. And then I need to, okay, I can maybe tab to edit mode, turn on my overlays, invert the selection, shift L to deselect these and focus on the dark metal at the bottom. I'll go a few minutes over, but shouldn't be too much longer. The last thing I want to show you, the most tedious part, is going to be painting on along all the edges. But uh, we'll get there in just a second. Turn off my overlays, back in texture paint mode, and I'm just going to hold control. Ooh, I forgot one. So there's another little ridge here. So I'll darken that a little bit more. Sorry, I'm kind of bouncing all over the place. I want to focus just in this area. Focusing with, uh, ah, undid my selection. There we go. All right, so back to texture paint mode. Darkening in the crevices. And now I can maybe go back with the white color and provide you know, some, some splotches of different color. I find that a splotchy type of pattern is important for the hand-painted look. But variety is my main goal at this point. All right, that way nothing is a solid color, but once we zoom out, it's got a lot more depth to the texture, I guess. So the last part, the last thing I need to worry about Oh, I need to also add some darkness specifically in here. Let's re-enable. Oh, I've got symmetry in enabled. There we go. So now I've got darkness on both the handle and the cross guard. So it's going to look like those are meeting up in reality. Now, the last part of this texture, let me save it real quick. 
is the edge detection, which I'm, it's really not gonna be detection, it's just me gonna be painting a lighter color on the edges specifically because most of your wear and tear is gonna be concentrated on your edges. They're the most exposed part of any object where the crevices are the most unexposed. So you're gonna have dirt and grime gathering in the crevices, that's why it's gathered around here. Let's turn off that, turn on occlusion. Just wanted to add a little bit more darkness in here. Um, that's why you see darkest, darkness, dust, grime gathering in the crevice, and then it's gonna be lighter once I get to the edges. Now for the edges, I still need to see that wireframe, so let's turn on my uh, overlays. And I've got my white color. I'm still gonna use the overlay blend mode. Where is it? Over here. And I can just start concentrating the white on the edge. Okay, so this is gonna be hard at first because I need the wireframe there to show me where the true edge is. But obviously I can't see the final effect until I turn it off, which is you know pretty annoying. Um, but my first pass is gonna be maybe lightly identifying the edges. I wonder if there's a better way to do this. Um, there might be, but I'm just gonna roll with this because we're running out of time. So, and it'll be effective enough. So turn the overlays on. I'm gonna also turn, yeah, this is what I can do. I'm gonna turn overlays on, also turn on symmetry in X and Y, all right? So this is just gonna be broad edge, edge detection. I'm just gonna be lightly painting on all the edges. Since this object is symmetrical in those directions, I can just focus on one quadrant. All right, once I do that, turn off my overlays. All right, so now I've got a decent idea of where the edges are. And I can focus more specifically, maybe increase the strength and start. Okay, uh, will I use symmetry? Go ahead, why not? This is a good opportunity to, to not use symmetry and add asymmetry. Um, which I think the better choice, but just for um, if you know getting somewhere faster. All right, so what I'm doing here is very sketch-like. I think a sketch-like approach to my brush strokes will uh, create this type of of um, worn and torn edge that I'm looking for. All right, so just stroking along the uh, the edges specifically, being splotchy. Whoops, there is a stray stroke being splotchy um, in th on this particular piece of the model there isn't there isn't any um, dents and dings I guess I kind of forgot to add that here but when you have dents and dings this is a great opportunity to um, highlight those and, and I'll, I'll jump over to the blade in just a second but when you zoom out after touching it you know just like t you know being sketchy I guess with the stroke is the best way I can think to describe it you know, you can definitely come in and make finer strokes as well. It really does have this worn and torn look. It, it looks pretty nice. Um, I think I'm being a little consistent right now. So like, uh, you know, this edge is is just too consistent, I think. I really should probably take the smear brush and kind of paint some of that out. There we go, make it a little less consistent that you can start to see the symmetry. So if we turn that off, go back to the, the paintbrush, then whatever I paint is gonna be asymmetrical. That's a, a good way to go about it. I don't want dark. All right, so that is the nature of painting edge wear and tear. And this is tedious uh, for this process because you're doing it all by hand and there are a lot of edges on this, but it's a pretty cool look in the end. Let me save this. Um, so now for the edges on the blade, let me just touch this really quickly. All right, so I'm using the white edge. Let me think. I think I will turn on symmetry just for the broad uh, strokes specifically. All right, here's where it doesn't work. You know, I, I added a little more concentration on this nick and it, it was mirrored to the other side. So that is not ideal. So I'm just going to be temporarily like avoiding the nick and just getting the broad shape so the, the edge is concentrated broadly. All right, so we've got some edge, edge brightness, but then I can come in here and be a little more, a little more specific with the nick. 
and paint just on that. This is really gonna make these stand out better. Be more noticeable from afar. Oh, I've got symmetry still on. That is not what we want. Turn that off. Okay. And there we go. Also a good opportunity to maybe enable um, pressure sensitivity for the radius of the brush so that if I'm lighter, the brush is, uh, is finer as well. All right, there we go. I'm gonna end it there. It's just the remainder is like the tedious aspect of painting all the individual edges, making sure that I'm diligent in that. But uh, by, by and large, we're done with this. Um, I can save the image and uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much all I wanted to show you. It's all I want you to do this week is just spending time hand painting your texture. We're not diving into the shaders yet. Just painting, just painting, learning Blender. Um, again, I think Blender is less intuitive at this. So take your time. Don't bite off too much. If you get frustrated, just take a break, come back the next day. Um, really to painting the entire, this entire sword should only have taken me honestly, like maybe 20, 30 minutes. But um, so therefore I made the scope small this week so that if it's frustrating for you, you can take your time. If it comes naturally to you, just paint it the, the most amazing thing, amazing texture we've ever seen. Um, but that is gonna be all for the stream today. Let me just go back. I, I tried to fast track it at the end to actually, you know, finish off the texture. Let me see if I've missed any questions. Why is there so much stress on realism? I think realism is a real challenge. Uh, I came from realism, so I can attest that achieving true photorealism is kind of the task that's almost within your grasp, but not quite. Um, but it's a, it's a fun challenge. Like it, uh, yeah, it's just a challenge. You wanna be able to create reality. You learn a lot, especially in shaders. I learned so much about the world, so much about lighting from trying to create photorealism. But I think it's just a preference. People like photorealism. Other people, like maybe yourself, don't get a kick out of it, and so you lean towards stylization. I really, I'm drawn to both, and so I'm, uh, I'm glad I'm drawn to both, I guess. Um, but yeah, I, I don't really know why it's that popular, other than to say that it's a challenge. Hello, Sergey. Um, we're just about to wrap up uh, in the next minute or so. I wanted to a answer any last minute questions. And uh, when is the stream available to rewatch? I'm pretty good about getting it available within 24 hours. So check back this time tomorrow and it, or between now and tomorrow. At the latest, by this time tomorrow, it should be available. Um, when coloring, how do you disable symmetry? Sorry, I missed that question, but it's, uh, it's these little X, Y, Z buttons up at the top. There's also, I think, a menu for it in the in the vertical column. If you click on your active tool settings, the uh, symmetry options right here. I think I saw him say this, but is he using his pencil for this part? Yes. Uh, once I started getting into detailing the texture, I, I prefer to use a pen and tablet, um, just a little more artistic, more natural for painting. Is there a way to have paint layers, like a layer for base color, one for color variation? Absolutely, you can do that. It's nowhere near as intuitive as Photoshop. It's a it's a much more advanced painting technique. Um, I, st if I can point you somewhere. If you go to the past live events and painting a simple airplane, I started to get into that approach, but didn't really flesh it out the way I, I, I wish I had. I wish. I had been able to. Um, again, it's not a terribly intuitive system, and so harder to work with than it is easier to work with, but you definitely can set up a, a, a layer system. Um, it's just gonna feel like pulling teeth. Let's see, but yeah, check that stream out if you wanna see, if you wanna glimpse that workflow. Omar, do you think uh, if I take a year off 3D to learn basics of art, human figure, color theory, drawing, etc. I will forget too much of 3D and it will actually be harmful. No, no, definitely not. I do not think that taking a year off, as, as, as skilled as you are and as long as you've been doing this, you, I think you would pick it up pretty quickly. You, it might be like shaking the rust off of your, of your skills, but like, 
I don't think you can forget these skills that easily. It's, it's, uh, I mean, you should know, like you invest a lot into learning 3d and I just don't think you're going to forget these skills. You get rusty, but, but you'll pick them back up. And if you are actually learning those things specifically, you're going to come back with a better, a better understanding of how to, how to create with 3d, a better, like how to get the most out of your 3d. So if you want to do that, like go for it. I know that, that Jonathan Williams said a few years ago, like took a, like a six week course, like all about sculpting the human figure. And it was like really in depth. And like, he came back not having touched 3d for, for those six weeks came back like a better, a much better artist for it. So, um, anyway, hope I answered your question. You will not forget too much of 3d and it won't be harmful. All right. I think I've answered all the questions. Awesome. All right. So I'm going to let you go. I've kept you about 15 minutes over. Um, thank you for watching. Uh, again, we'll be back in the homework threads. I'm going to finish grading everyone's week one homework. Uh, if you're just joining and you did not participate in week one, but you want to participate in the remainder to week two and three, just you can just uh, do week one's homework and week two's homework and submit at the end of week two this coming Sunday night. Uh, and I'll grade both of them. So that's fine. Um, again, uh, I guess that's it. I, I uh, will see you next week. Yeah, I think that's it. All right. Thank you guys for watching. Hope it was helpful. And I will see you in the homework threads. Have a good rest of your Tuesday.